Aloha, my name is Sherry Tamashiro. I am a three and a half generation Okinawan and Japanese born and raised in Hawaii. Um, I work as a librarian at Kopiolani Community College at the University of Hawaii. Um, you know, I went to college in Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota, and we were really close to the Military Intelligence Service Language School over at Fort, Selling, Fort Snelling and Camp Savage. And one of uh, the professors at McAllister, his father-in-law was an instructor at the MISLS uh, named Edwin Nagahashi. And he introduced me to Edwin, who kind of adopted me. And that was my first real introduction to the story of you know, the Japanese Americans who fought during World War II. Uh, when I came home, I got a job at Kapilani Community College. And in my role as a librarian, um, I took part in a three-pronged project where the university wanted to honor the Nisei from Hawaii for their contributions to the state. The first part was Center for Oral History, doing 30 video life histories of Nisei, including women, um, that ran about six hours each. Um, the second part was Hamilton Library, our university's library, created the Japanese American Veterans Collection that would start create, collecting uh, the documentation of the Nisei. And, you know, my team came in to kind of broadly share these stories. And so what we did was we created the Hawaii Nisei story, which is at nisei.hawaii.edu, which tells the stories using digital storytelling. Um, from there, I kind of morphed into cre using the materials that we created, the resources like the photos and the primary source materials and the stories told to create print exhibits. Um, so, you know, I was lucky enough to create an exhibit for Central Pacific Bank, um, as well as the exhibit that went up at Bishop Museum. Um, I also curated the changing exhibit called Looking Like the Enemy. Um, that's part of the Pearl Harbor's um, The Attack building. So in all of this, I had the privilege of being able to talk story at great length with a lot of the Nisei veterans from Hawaii who were still alive at the time. And most of them are gone. Um, but, you know, I kind of see my role as, as a storyteller, trying to share the stories that they passed on. Um, one of them asked me, you know, before he died, do you think we will be forgotten when we're gone? And I've always remembered that. And, you know, I tell their stories because I don't want their stories to be forgotten. Um, you know, the look of sadness in, in Stanley's eyes when he sincerely asked, do you think our stories will be forgotten? Um, so I wanted to share some of their stories with you at this time, passing on the stories uh, that the boys left. So what I'm doing today is more of a informal talk story about some of the experiences of the Japanese Americans in Hawaii during World War II. I can't cover everything um, and I'm gonna miss things, but I'll reference sources that you can look at, whether it's print or online, um, where you can really go into more detail and dive into any of the topics that I introduce you to, um, which will provide you with all the dates, details, and numbers that you could possibly want. So that's the goal that we're setting up. So I'm gonna start with December 7th, 1941. It's important to note that before the attack on Pearl Harbor, more than one third of Hawaii's population was of Japanese ancestry. Um, that caused some concern. You know, bearing the face of the enemy, the attack on Pearl Harbor immediately cast Japanese, um, Japanese Americans and those of Japanese ancestry under suspicion from people who were friends, their neighbors, and even their country. So it's important to note that before the attack, around 4,000 Nisei, so that second generation Japanese Americans, were already serving in the US Army because of the draft. They were drafted into the 298th and 299th Infantry Regiments. So the 298th were focused on Oahu, the 299th were comprised of uh, the guys from the neighbor islands outside of Oahu. 
And you know, the story I wanted to share with you was is from Private First Class Rei Nosaka, who was on duty at Schofield Barracks when uh, the attack occurred, and he actually saw the bombs falling. And he was soon reassigned to guard the Waimanalo shoreline, so that's kind of a remote beach shoreline. And you know, normally he didn't have any bullets, um, but at this point he's given live ammunition. Um, Ray told me that rumors went around that in the back there were Haoli's or Caucasian soldiers. The rumor was that these soldiers were placed behind because, you know, they're ready to shoot. Kind of like they're not trusting and that they think we're going to go back and attack them. And so whether this was true or not, this was the rumors that the, the Nisei were feeling at the time, including Ray. And so the military didn't know what to do with these 4,000 Nisei who were already in uniform and serving in the U.S. Army. So, you know, one of the things that's, that's interesting is that Japanese Americans or those of Japanese ancestry not in uniform were declared, later were declared 4C enemy alien, ineligible for service, but those who were already in service, you know, the 4,000 ones in uniform, were kind of in a limbo where they really didn't know what to do with them. Um, you know, the term Nisei is, is not quite accurate because there were some Sansei, third generation, including the number, and I know that the term used today is Nikkei, um, but I'm going to be using Nisei because it's just, I think it fits in this particular context. So this is a situation, you know, when Pearl Harbor is attacked. And the surprise attack prompts Congress to declare war on Japan. And so, as you know, hysteria ran rampant and, you know, there were charges of Japanese fifth columns and the fear of sabotage. What will happen with these Japanese and Japanese Americans residing in the islands? Will they turn? and help Japan invade. And so there's a, a backlash against the first generation and the second generation, the Ise and Nisei, living on Hawaii and the mainland. Um, Ron Oba, who is a Nisei, who later joined F Company of the 442, he told me, quote, at first I was angry, then I was kind of ashamed that our ancestors had come. And then my parents, you could see they were so sad, so humiliated that their ancestors would come and attack Hawaii. Later, as the FBI came around corralling people, fear crept in, everybody started to get scared. So what happened was that the FBI had lists, I think there was tiers, where you know, like the top level were the ones that were immediately picked up um, on December 7th. And a lot of them were uh, priests, business leaders, um, newspaper editors, very prominent people or leaders within the Japanese American community. Um, there's a great book called Life Behind Barbed Wire by um, Yasutaro Soga, which really details the experience uh, of, of the people who were picked up in that first wave. Um, he was taken to Sand Island Detention, uh, eventually to Honouli, Uli, and then I think to a DOJ camp. So one thing to note is that there was no mass evacuation and imprisonment that happened in Hawaii. So Hawaii went under martial law, and it was under the control of military governor general, uh, military governor Delos Emmons, where, you know, this man is remarkable. He decided not to act on Executive Order 9066, and he deflected the attempts to incarcerate the 150,000 Japanese living in Hawaii. Um, of that number, around 2,400 were detained in Hawaii at Honouli Uli or the Sand Island Detention Center, um, or they were sent to confinement sites or Department of Justice sites on the mainland. So the Department of Justice sites were different from, you know, the incarceration sites, you know, like Rower and, and Manzanar. These were actually run under a different jurisdiction, and a lot of the priests and the first wave of leaders were sent there. And I believe um, Gail Okawa is coming out with a book that details the experience of her, one of her ancestors, um, at a DOJ camp, which is, is, I think it's fascinating. But, you know, the, the story in Hawaii is, is, is worth looking into or learning because 
instead of the hysteria that you saw happening on the mainland, what you saw in Hawaii was that there was a lot of calm heads. So of particular note is the Committee for Interracial Unity and Morale section, which was led by a Chinese American YMCA executive named Hung Wai Ching and a Japanese American school principal, Shigeo Yoshida, along with other people like um, uh, Shivers, who was in charge of the FBI, the FBI agent in charge of, of Honolulu, and um, the, the police chief. And, you know, they calmed things down. They worked with Emmons and convinced Emmons to protect the civil liberties of, you know, the Japanese people living in Hawaii, which led to the decision not to mass remove them. Um, another person who was influential was, as I mentioned, Robert Shivers, the FBI agent in charge of Honolulu. And so, you know, the interesting part of the story is that Robert Shivers came to the islands with his wife, and he had a live-in schoolgirl named Sue Isonaga, um, who was doing work with the family as she was going to school to be a cafeteria manager. And Sue is the first Asian that they've ever encountered, and they fell in love with her, and they wanted to adopt her. And, you know, Sue, this humble schoolgirl, is probably one of the reasons that really influenced Robert Shivers about going to bat to fight for Japanese Americans. Um, I don't know the exact, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's something like, you know, um, I can't let Sue and people like Sue be taken away. They are loyal, loyal Americans. Um, Sue is one of the, the people profiled in the Hawaii Nisei story. And I think that in her quiet way, she had such a huge impact on the path of history in Hawaii. Um, one other story I wanted to share was the Oahu Black Identification Badges. So right after the attack, defense workers with Japanese ancestry were actually called in to have identification pictures taken. Um, and they did that as armed guards watched. So these identification badges were clearly identified from far away because they had a thick black border and the word restricted, really big, uh, written to indicate that the bearer was confined to designated work areas only. So non-Japanese work, defense workers, they um, had badges that were bordered with white and didn't have the restricted designation on it. So this is what's happening in the days after the attack. So what's happening simultaneously is that the University of Hawaii ROTC their cadets are ordered to report to campus shortly after the attack. Um, you know, there's stories about how they gathered in the gym and they were handed Springfield rifles from 1905, so World War I rifles, um, and they were quickly taught how to use, and use them, and each were handed five bullets. And they were sent to buildings and installations throughout the islands to guard them. I asked, um, Yoshiaki Fujitani once, what happened, you know, if there were six people coming against you, what would you do with only five? And he just laughed. But, you know, the story is, is that um, some higher ups came and were quite alarmed when they saw these Japanese Americans guarding installations. So six weeks later, January 1942, um, the Nisei, members of the Hawaii Territorial Guard, are, abru are abruptly classified as 4C enemy aliens, ineligible for service. Um, you know, Ted Sukiyama, who was my mentor, he wrote it really eloquently. He said, if a bomb had been exploded in our midst, it could not have been more devastating. We were hit by the painful reality that we, Japanese Americans, were being rejected and disowned by our own country just because we bore the face of the enemy. It never occurred to us that we would be ever doubted or challenged. We had been born, raised, and educated as Americans all the way to have our own country in its most extreme time of danger reject and repudiate our services was almost beyond comprehension. There was no depth to which our emotions sank the very bottom dropped out of our existence. So 
the university ROTC cadets were called into active service. I believe it is the only time ROTC cadets were called into active service in, in US history, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they were classified as ineligible. So, you know, Ted and his friends went back to the university and were devastated. And so the story is, is that they were sitting under a tree and Hung Wai Ching, the YMCA executive, came up to them and told them that you do not have to hold a gun or a rifle to serve your country. Why not hold a shovel or a pick to, do, to show your loyalty? And so he encouraged them to create a volunteer labor battalion. And Ted drafted a petition that was sent to General Emmons which read in part, Hawaii is our home, the United States, our country. We know but one loyalty, and that is to the Stars and Stripes. We wish to do our part as loyal Americans in every way possible, and we hereby offer ourselves for whatever service you may see fit to use us. So this petition is accepted by Emmons in February of 1942, and the first all Nisei volunteer unit of World War II, the Varsity Victory Volunteers, or the VVV, is created. So even though they're civilians, the 169 VVV members are assigned to the 34th Combat Engineers Regiment of Schofield Army Base. So they leave the university and their studies, and they spend the next 11 months doing essential defense work, including backbreaking labor in stone quarries, as well as construction, and road work. So you remember I told you about the 4,000 Nisei who were already in uniform, uh, who were kind of in limbo after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So in May of 1942, members of the 298th and the 299th Infantry Regiments of the Hawaiian National Guard are selected to join a newly created Hawaii Provisional Infantry Battalion. So the creation of this all Japanese American and all from Hawaii, battalion is kept under wraps. So in June of 1942, at midnight under the cover of darkness, 1,432 men leave Honolulu Harbor for California. Um, when they arrive in California, they're officially activated as the 100th Infantry Battalion separate, in parentheses. So, what this means is that the 100th is an orphan battalion. They are not assigned to any regiment. Um, hence, that's why they have separate, in parentheses, appended to their name, 100th Infantry Battalion separate. So in June of 1942, the War Department announces that it's not going to accept for service uh, with the armed services, Japanese or other persons of Japanese extraction regardless of their citizen status, citizenship status or other factors. And so what happens to the 100th Infantry Battalion separate? And you know, the army, of course, is not gonna send them to the Pacific or, and you know, they debate whether they should even be sent to Europe. So unable to fight, join the fight, the 100th is sent to Camp McCoy in Wisconsin uh, for another round of basic training. So remember, these guys had already been drafted and went through basic training. So this is like round two. And you know they, they have this training until January 1943, um, when they're, the 100th is sent to Camp Shelby, Mississippi for large unit training. The 100th is probably one of the most trained units in the United States Army. So you know they still have the problem of not knowing what to do with the 100th. And so they actually get sent in August to Oran, Africa, where they're designated to be on guard duty. Um, the, the commander of the 100th petitions and fights, or, or con tries to convince um, the higher ups to let them fight. So eventually, they are allowed to join the 34th Red Bull Division of the American 5th Army in Italy, under the command of Lieutenant General Mark Clark, who was willing to take a chance on them. That's why for with the 100th, um, you see the Red Bull patch on them. Um, so when the 100th lands in Salerno in September of 1943, 
they have 1,300 men. Five months later, they could only muster 521 men after fierce battles at the Volturno River and the Battle of Monte Cassino. So, you know, according to Lynn Cross, the correspondent who wrote this book, she said that war correspondents had watched and admired and written about the 100th Battalion during this devastating campaign. And in the US, it had become known as the Purple Heart Battalion. So Purple Hearts is a medal you get um, for injury. And, you know, the 100th had so many casualties that uh, they had the designation Purple Heart Battalion. For their endurance and pluck and bravery in the face of insurmountable odds, the 100th were hailed as the Little Iron Men, a description later given as well to the men of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. So 100th is pretty decimated. And so around 555 replacements are sent over from the 4 442 Regimental Combat Team uh, to replenish their ranks. So this was a mixture of Hawaii guys and Nisei from the mainland. So it's at this point that they are no longer an all Hawaii battalion. They have all these replacements coming in. Um, you know, there's a lot of confusion about the naming. So 100th Infantry Battalion separate uh, was when they were not attached to anyone and, and joined, you know, the, the 5th Army, the Red Bull Division. Um, when the 442 eventually joins them in Europe, they leave behind um, their first battalion to do more training, uh, to train other troops, and the 100th takes their place. But because of their distinction in battle, they're allowed to keep their designation. Hence, you see the, the title 100th slash 442nd Regimental Combat Team. And, you know, in Hawaii, there also is the, the separation of whether they were 100 original or 100th replacement. I hope that makes sense. So one of the oddities that happened while the, the 100th were in Wisconsin is that 25 of them were secretly pulled out of the ranks and taken to Ship Island in Mississippi. Um, the plan was for them to train dogs over on Cat Island. Um, so basically what happened was there was a, I think a Swiss, there was a guy who convinced the military that he could train dogs to smell Japanese um, because they had a distinct odor that the dogs would be able to identify. And so, you know, the, the hope was that if they could train these dogs to identify Japanese by smell, they could let them loose in the jungles in the Pacific Theater and the dogs would sniff out the Japanese soldiers and take them out. And so they thought, well, let's take 25 of the Japanese Americans from Hawaii in the 100th and have them do dog training on Cat Island. There isn't a lot of information out there about this, um, but there is an essay that was written by Yasuo Takata and Rei Nasaka about the secret mission of Baker Company. But what I, I really want to emphasize is, you know, Ray said that they were not there to train dogs. They were dog bait. So what happened was each Nisei was assigned a breed, a different breed of dog, and they had to make the dog hate them so that the dog would come after them. Um, they pretty much just had hockey, goalie, padding, um, some tape, and so like Ray would say, one of his assignments was to go into the, the jungle area on, on Cat Island, climb up a tree and see if the dog would track him down. If the dog did track him down, when it got to the tree, Ray was supposed to tumble out of it and let the dog savage him. Like dog bait. Um, you know, many, many years later, Ray showed me the scars he still has. Um, he talked about having to hold beef to his neck to teach the dog to, to go for the juggler. It, it's, you know, obviously it didn't work. Um, Japanese don't have a distinct odor. Um, the dogs were not able, they were able to uh, find the, their particular soldier they were assigned to, but not a Japanese. So 
Um, I don't know if this document is available online anywhere. I'll try and post it up. It's about five pages of details that just talk about what they were doing. So, you know, I mentioned there were different breeds. So there was uh, shepherds, labs, retrievers, wolfhounds, pointers, collies, bloodhounds, boxers. Um, the chief trainer was an old man of Swiss descent. I'm going to read you this example. In the beginning, training scout dogs was fun. All we had to do was hide ourselves in the jungle with a jar of horse meat. Each dog trainer then sent his dog out to find us. When the dog spotted us, the trainer would fire a shot and we would drop dead with a piece of meat held in our hands in front of our necks. The dogs would eat the meat and lick our faces. I don't know whether the dogs smelled the meat or our Japanese blood. When the dogs became too friendly, we were ordered to use our whips, slingshots, and rocks to chase the dogs away so they would not come too close or get too friendly with us. The training continued each day as long as the boat came to get us from Ship Island. I think it's, it's one of those stories that you really listen to it and think, is this for real? Did they honestly think that dogs would be able to smell Japanese? So let's use Japanese Americans to, to train them. I, I can't remember where I read this account, um, so I can't verify it, but I'd like to, to find out more about it. I did read an account where, because you know United States didn't know a lot about Japan, they looked to the writings of Lafcadio Hearn, or Lafcadio Han, as he was known in Japan, who spent his time documenting the folklore and myths and legends of Japan. And reading that, they thought, hmm, they seem to be afraid of this tanuki or badgers. And so I did read an account of a Japanese American who said he was pulled for secret training where they uh, threw badgers at him think, in hopes that he would faint or panic. Um, and I don't know if the plan would be that soldiers would take around badgers and throw it at Japanese soldiers. Um, but again, that didn't work either. Um, it's a story I'd like to find out more about, but regardless, the dog training or the dog bait and, and even throwing badgers are some of the more absurd things that happened. Um, I'm going to stop right now and we will continue on our journey uh, next episode. Aloha.